So this is a uh, six-part course on different areas of mystical thought. Um, and you're going to hear a lot of things, I think, over the next six, seven weeks, which you've never actually heard of uh, before discussed. In Judaism, we're going to be talking about dreams. We're going to be talking about um, astrology. We're going to be talking about the evil eye and the whole red uh, bracelet thing, which people keep overspending money on. And uh, we're going to begin this evening with something which I, I get a lot of questions about in general, and uh, I've done a lot of research into, and it's one of my pet topics. And it's a topic which you don't hear rabbis speaking about too much, so much so that many people think it's not part of Judaism, it's part of Buddhism. Right? Because everyone, all the Jews like Buddhism, so spiritual. Well, actually, it comes from Judaism. And I'm going to give you just a short selection of ideas and thoughts and some stories and some thoughts from you as well um, on the topic of reincarnation. And hence, the topic this evening is, haven't I seen you before, reincarnation in Jewish thought? By the way, put your hands up if, if you actually knew that reincarnation uh, is a Jewish concept. Put your hands up. Okay, so, so I'll say about half of you realized uh, that um, there's something to it. Well, let's begin with the beginning. And uh, something we mentioned last semester, and it's all about the soul, right? Because really, that's what we're talking about over here. Uh, the body is just a clothing for the soul. As I've mentioned before, in Jewish thought, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. And we're given this physical clothing called a body, whether it's six foot two, if you're Tom, uh, and five foot three if you're Jewish, and you're given this, <laughs> this, this wrapping that goes around your soul, your neshama. Actually, you have five different souls, not for now. We'll talk about that later on in the course. Um, and uh, this soul uh, actually is a part of God, and it's our essence. And the body really is um, on loan. It will help us uh, achieve various things in this world. We're not discussing the body this evening. We're discussing the soul itself. And we see in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 2, verse 7, God formed man, this is man as human, of the dust from the ground, and he breathed <clears throat> into his nostrils the soul of life, and man became a living being. So we see that God put in this aspect, and Rashi, the famous con uh, commentator, says God actually made humans, of two opposites, right? We are two very different opposites. We're physical beings, right? With the hands, the brain, and the legs, and that's what helps us achieve things in this world, but we're also a neshama, a neshama, a soul, and these two very different things, because one is totally physical, and the other is totally spiritual, and they come together, and the soul is held inside this body. Sometimes it could actually get out and attached to other people, but we'll talk about the books another time. But uh, in general, for most of us, thank goodness, this soul remains within the body uh, for the duration of life. And then, as you know, death, right, which everyone knows is inevitable, as Woody Allen says, two inevitabilities are death and taxes. So eventually, the body and the soul separate, okay? And that we call that death. Okay, we all agree that death is... Okay, and that's when the body returns to the earth, and it decomposes, but the person lives on. Right? Death is not the end. I will talk about the world to come in one of the later classes where the soul goes to. That's not the discussion this evening. The discussion this evening is an idea, and it's an idea within Judaism, and not everyone agrees with it or speaks about it too much, but the Kabbalists do, and actually it's not even a principle of our thought. The world to come, that the soul lives and exists, is a Jewish concept and an obligation to believe in. And the fact the soul goes to another location after it separates from the body, is also a principle of Jewish thought. But there is an idea which is discussed at length, and we'll see even reference in the Torah itself, or I should say hinted at in the Torah itself, called Gilgul Neshamot, that the soul returns to this world in different bodies over time. How many times we'll see differences of opinions about that, and comes back a number of times. If you don't mind me asking, I mean, have you heard the expression like this person's like an old soul? Have you heard that expression before? Old soul. It's something we kind of, our generation has a thing for this, by the way. There's a reason why, which is not for now. We'll discuss the idea of the Messiah, which will be right at the end of the course. We'll see why our particular generation has a certain feeling for this, which maybe our parents and grandparents maybe didn't have, but that'll be felt later on. So let's have a look at the source. So that's Rashi, body and soul put together. And the soul, says the Kliyaka, one of the deeper sources, is eternal and intellectual spirit. Okay, and as we say, it comes from God. And when we say it comes from God, 
we're really saying it's part of God. Right? Just like a, uh, this is the analogy the Kabbalists use. If a person, when they make glass, right, they, they blow into the glass and it kind of exp expands. Right? So the breath of the glass blower is inside the glass vessel. So if I were able to go into that glass vessel and pull out some of the air and break, I could actually see, be part of the original glass blower. So actually God blows a soul into all humanity, and whatever that means, there's a little bit of God inside all of us. Okay? And that's the idea of life. That's what gives us life, okay? So part of being alive in this world is for the soul to achieve goodness. Okay, and the Torah revealed this to us. You can look halfway down page one, those who are following. That a person should not make the mistake of thinking that since we're born complete, like with hands and arms and everything else, God willing, uh, a person will achieve perfection without effort. Okay, it's not true, he says. The idea of being in this world, this is important to understand the rest of the class. The idea of being in this world and doing good deeds, right, and doing spiritual activities and all the things we do, working, living, having children, all of that is there for one reason, to improve the soul, improve the neshama. That's really what we're meant to be doing. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we hear, everything we see, everything we touch, everything we're involved in, whether we live for 100 years, for 50 years, for 20 years, and we'll see even for one year, just the soul, this is very important, just the soul being in this world, this physical, finite, messy, schmutzy, challenging, dealing with jobs and bosses and employers and employees and bills and boyfriends and girlfriends and, and so much difficulty, all of that isn't for no reason. That is there to improve our soul. Just the soul being in this world. Actually, and we'll see this a little bit later, just the soul being a fetus in a womb gives it a tikkun, a fix-up. Okay? So that's the idea of the Kliyakar. He's saying that's why the soul comes to this world. We don't come to this world to just partake. Right? We come to achieve and to do good and to improve ourselves through our actions. Okay, that's a basic Jewish concept. Nothing weird over there. But I mention it because that's part of, of what the human is all about. Says the Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. Um, he was an Italian uh, Kabbalist and great thinker. Wrote a book called Derech Hashem, a number of books. I uh, wrote one called Derech Hashem, The Way of God. You can actually buy it. And this book, he actually goes through, it's a very famous uh, classic book, and you'll see it in all the Jewish um, libraries and yeshivot. He says in this book, um, explains how the spiritual world works. You see, the physical world has a system, but he says the spiritual world has a system as well. It works according to certain guidelines. Okay, there's certain levels, sefirot, that God uses to run the world, and they actually make sense. I mean, really, Kabbalah is actually logic of how God actually runs this world. And he says, and this is translated, the highest wisdom, referring to God, decreed, the man should consist of two opposites, we know body and soul. These are his pure spiritual soul, an unenlightened physical body. Each one is drawn towards its nature, so the body inclines toward the material, the soul leads toward the spiritual. And the constant battle we're having to do good, right, or sleep in, or help other people, or be selfish, is really that battle, okay? So the soul gets a chance to fix itself. But let's say it doesn't manage to do it in one lifetime. Let's say a person is not a good person. Let's say a person is a great person, but didn't do enough, because there's a lot to do. Or let's say a person didn't fulfill a mission which they had during this lifetime. Let's say a person dies young, heaven forbid. We shouldn't know such things. Okay, does this, that's it? It's over? And the answer is no. It could be that this individual has a chance to come back into this world. Now it's the same soul, but in a different body, as we'll see. Maybe even a different gender. Maybe even a different being, as we're going to see from the sources. And get to achieve what it didn't achieve once, or maybe twice, maybe three times. And according to one opinion, we're going to see maybe a hundred times. It depends. Okay? So there's a hint to this idea of reincarnation in the Torah itself. When I say the Torah, I mean the five books of Moses, yeah? There's a mitzvah, one of the 613 mitzvot, right, in the Bahabal, is called, most people don't even know this one, right? Everyone's heard of Shabbat, and everyone's heard of Pesach, everyone's heard of Tzedakah, and everyone's heard of Yibum, Yibawa. So there is a mitzvah, which doesn't actually exist now, and you know how to do it nowadays, but it's called Yibum. And Yibam is one of the 630 mitzvah. This is very interesting. And the mitzvah goes like this. You have two brothers. 
and one of the brothers gets married. And the other brother does not get married. He is Jewish and single. Sound familiar? Okay. And um, the, the married brother, unfortunately, gets ill and dies before he is able to have any children. So now we have a widow. Are you following the mitzvah? We have the widow. And we have the single brother left alive. There is a mitzvah from the Torah if they want to. They don't have to do it. Now they're not allowed to do it, right? It's only in Talmudic times, right? Or stopped. Why is not for now? But if they want to, they have a special mitzvah to marry, i.e. the live brother is meant to marry his sister-in-law. Why? So look inside the book of Deuteronomy. This is from the Torah itself. And it says, when brothers dwell together, one of them dies and has no child, the widow shall not remarry to one not of his kin. Her brother-in-law shall come to her and take it to himself as a wife and perform the Leverite marriage. It's called Yiba marriage, special marriage. And it shall be that the firstborn son that she bears shall succeed in the name of his dead brother, that his name not be blotted out from Israel. So they don't have to do it. But if they want to, they have a chance. Why do we want this to happen? Well, according to the Torah, we want his name to live on. Right? Now, when you read that, you're like, yeah, the dead brother, his name's Harry. Right? And he's gone. So we want little Harrys to come out, don't we? So he's got a nice name. Harry's a nice Jewish name. So we want to take that, isn't it? Yeah. So we take that name, Harry, and we want to, we want to pass it down because he's gone. Right? And we want his name to live on. But the interesting thing is, that's the basic understanding of the mitzvah. I want his name to just carry on. Like we pass names on to our grandchildren. He had no children. We want his name to live on this world. So the basic peshat, the basic understanding, right, the non-Kabbalistic understanding is, okay, fine. So basically he wants his name to live on and everyone wants to have the name perpetuated. And when we see Harry, I remember the dead brother. Oh, remember Harry? The, yeah, he's dead now. We have a son instead. Okay, that's very, very nice. And a beautiful mitzvah if you want to perform it. However, it's interesting that the number of times of famous cases where this yibum marriage happens, they notice something very interesting. The child that was born did not get the name of the dead brother. They actually named the kid something else. Well, when you think of it, that defeats the whole purpose. Here's Harry, right? And this is Solly, right? I don't know, right? We're going like, this is Barry. And it loses the whole point. So the Kabbalists, I guess, are perplexed, and they say, because you're not getting to the deeper core of what this mitzvah is about, says the Zohar, the Kabbalistic work from about 2,000 years ago, if you want to understand this mitzvah, and actually he says any mitzvah, you can understand it on a Peshat level, that means a basic understanding, but there's also a Drush, Remez, and Sod. Sod is a secret, a secret level to every single mitzvah. And it's a secret, here is reincarnation. It's not the name. When she marries that brother, she's bringing the neshama of her deceased husband back into this world and allowing him to fulfill the mission that he missed out. Why he missed out, we don't know. Only God knows, right? We don't know why his soul was taken at this point. Maybe the single brother had to get married. Maybe he did a terrible thing. Maybe he would have got, who knows? We don't know. But this is the way to bring it in. And then there's a whole discussion in the Kabbalah, which is not for now, of why brothers, right? Why not uncles, aunts? And there's something about brothers being closer than fathers and sons, Right? So there's a whole discussion of that. In other words, it could have been that this guy dies and she marries his dad. <laughs> I mean, it could have been. It sounds disgusting to us. But it could have been. No. The Kabbalah says whatever this means, two brothers are like one pool of water. Whatever that means. And that's why this person... So the Kabbalists say, you see here, the hinted idea of reincarnation. Okay? So the question is, fine. So we have this idea in Judaism, which goes back thousands of years... Right, back to, remember, the Zohar and all these are oral Torah. I mean, they go back to Mount Sinai. And actually, we'll see that they refer to reincarnation even before, even before Mount Sinai. To remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All these individuals were all reincarnations from other individuals. We'll see some of that a little bit later. But why do we need it? I mean, why did God have to create it that way? Why can't a person just, like, get it done the first time? I mean, I like this world and everything. But, you know, being a kid is pretty miserable. And being a teenager, the whole like spot time, you know, like zits and everything, that wasn't so good, right? And then trying to go to college, you know what I'm saying? And it's not so, not so enjoyable, is it? I mean, I mean, nice world, God, I like it. Grand Canyon, very nice. Israel, had a good fun there. But can I just do it once? 
Right? Isn't that like fair? So we're going to see a few answers as to why it has to be a person that has to come back more than once. Okay? And says the Ramchal, the same individual of Moshe Chaim Lozato, in his book, he says a single soul can be reincarnated a number of times in different bodies. And in this manner, it can rectify the damage done in previous incarnations. In other words, a person does terrible things. They stole, they hit, they killed, whatever it is. We're saying that that soul needs to come back in order to fix up that which it didn't fix up the first time. So really, it may not be pleasant to come back into this world, but because you're in the, your soul is in the spiritual world having a great time, you know, basking in the glory of God or whatever you, know, you do up there. Come on, say, let me just go through this. We'll take questions later or comments, right? But really, we're saying that that soul had stuff to kind of fix up. I didn't really do it. So God's like, you know, I'll do you a favor. You get to go back, okay? Truth be told, according to the soul, actually it says in Pirakal Vot, right, that actually the soul doesn't want to come back. <laughs> it's a big risk. It's a big risk. That's because I, I, excuse the expression, screwed up the first time, because I'm not screwed up the second time, right? So, but God says it's better for you this way, and boop, so only you, a person's soul only achieves greatness by being in this physical world and not in the higher levels of spiritual world. And he says there are many details on the concept of reincarnation involving the manner in which an individual is judged, right? Because the soul leaves this world, is judged, and then God decides whether to pass it on, you know, up or come back into this world or go somewhere else, speak about uh, hell another time. And now this judgment depends on previous incarnations, and we don't know how that is. The crucial point, however, is the fact that all is fair. This is very important. It ain't just some random lottery, right? It's not like everyone's put down, all the souls are put in like a roulette wheel. Okay, place your bets, place your bets. Okay, you become Sheila, you become, and everyone's off. You know? It ain't like that. Everything which we humans cannot do, God judges everything that a person goes through, who their parents were, their upbringing, the insults they got in high school, all the difficulties, all the challenges, all that's added, then all the good things, the bad things, and then God has the ability somehow, which is beyond our comprehension, to work it all out and say, you need to go into that body at that time in order to achieve what you have to achieve. With those parents, with that job, with that wife, that husband, with that child, or the challenge of having a child, or having an ill child, or being an ill person yourself, all of that is mixed into the account. This is very important. And God knows exactly what it is, and that's what he's saying. Trust me, he says, it's all fair. There's nothing unfair. I was like, why couldn't I have been a multi-billionaire? Why, why couldn't I? I, know, I could have done Facebook. I could have done that. Right? But that's not my soul. Right? My soul is to post on Facebook regularly. Right? My soul wasn't to earn the billions of dollars for it. My soul is to waste time on Facebook. Probably not, actually. But um, everyone has their own personal. No created being, he says, can encompass the way this works. Okay? Now, there are some people I've met over the years um, who have said they actually had some kind of hypnotic um, regression. They've taken it back to past lifetimes. And the answer is, it could be or it couldn't be. I was given a tape. Remember those tape things? They're like... Okay. You're, too, um, you're too young for that. Um, but there used to be a thing called tapes, actually. Right? And um, by the way, do you remember floppy disks? Yeah. You know the amazing thing? My daughter used a computer, and she looks at the save button, and she's like, oh, but what is that? They still use the floppy disk on the save button. <laughs> I'm like, that, I said, forget about it. Just, it saves it, okay? Right, so um, I, I was given a tape. It's true, right? It's amazing, right? That everyone's, like, everyone's like pressing this little symbol, and all that, no one knows what the heck it's for anymore, right? Uh, of that age anyway. So I was given this tape, and again, I can't prove it to you. And I'll talk about some studies that were done by colleges on this topic, and you may have seen some videos on YouTube about it. It's very fascinating. But I had one tape that was uncanny, given to one of my teachers, and in this tape was a French woman being hypnotized by a, psych a psychiatrist in France about 20, 30 years ago. And uh, it's in French, and I don't speak French, but suddenly it changes to English, and the woman is actually going through hypnosis, and it was being taped by the psychiatrist, who happens to be a Jewish guy interesting, which is how we get hold of the tape. And um, she's discussing her life and how she actually lives in a place called Matlock. Has anyone heard of Matlock? Yeah, neither have I, right? It's the middle of England. I don't know what the heck it is, you know what I'm saying? And she describes it, and she's talking English, and the psychiatrist is speaking his broken French, and she's speaking in, 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 in broken English, everything that happened to her, and he's speaking English as well, and, discuss it, and, she's, and she describes her death and her murder, right, at this time. And what's interesting, according to the psychiatrist, is that she doesn't actually speak English. Okay. So you hear these stories, and I've heard many of them. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Is a person able to regress? 
I've heard different stories. You know what? That I can't tell you. Is there a thing called reincarnation? Yes. All right. many, many say no. Some say no, I should say. Many say yes. But you take it or you leave it. Says the Arizal. And over here, I'm going to mention a very, uh, where is she sitting over here? There's a man. Put your hand up, Amanda. Amanda has a wonderful last name. What's Amanda's last name? Anybody know? Luria. What? Luri, okay, or Luria, yeah, depends how you pronounce it. And uh, she is a direct descendant of someone who's considered to be, I'm right, no? One of the greatest Kabbalists that ever lived, right? Uh, his name was the Arizal. The whole Sfat thing was with us in Sfat, his synagogue's there, right? He died at a very young age. And he is actually considered to be one of the more recent Kabbalists in Jewish history who took, like, the esoteric teachings of mystical Judaism and kind of, like, made it uh, user-friendly. So he wasn't the first Kabbalist, and probably wasn't one of the greatest ones, but he was, he's famous because he kind of like normalized it and made us like, when we study these ideas, really he's one who kind of like tweaked it in order for us to understand. He was a very great uh, Jew, and he wrote a number of books, well, a number of books written um, by people. And he says in his introduction to a book he wrote called Shar HaGilgulim, right? Reincarnation in Hebrew is Gilgul, which means to go around. And he wrote in the introduction to this book, there's three reasons why people reincarnate into this world. Reason number one, he says, is to repair spiritual damage that was incurred through transgressions in previous life. We mentioned that. Number two, achieving a level of perfection that was not achieved previously. That means they died young, right? Or they died at an old age, but didn't get a chance to achieve what they could have achieved. They could have done more, right? They did 95%, but for the extra five, listen, this is important. They did 95%, but the other 5%, God says, you know what? You got so close to fulfilling your mission in this world, I'm going to send you back in. So that's a very holy soul, isn't it? It's a 95% or whatever that means. That's good. The first one, maybe not so good. Oh, but the second one, and you don't know who's who. And number three, one may be reincarnated for the purpose of helping others. Some people's souls are here as maybe a grandparent, parent, child. And by the way, this idea I mentioned before of children's names being named after people, right? Even to this day, that idea is, to some degree, that person's soul is coming down through the family line. And the name a person gets is very much related to their soul. Because the Hebrew word for a soul is a neshama. And the middle two letters of a neshama are shame, which means name. Because your Hebrew name signifies your essence, which is very important when you need a good Hebrew name. In other words, a person could have a bad Hebrew name, and you don't want that. Okay? And not having a Hebrew name means you still have a soul. You just don't know your barcode name that goes with it. So a person can come back into this world actually to help others. Help others achieve something. That means the person you end up marrying one day could be a very righteous person, as I tell my wife the entire time. And I'm just here to help you achieve. So I'm going to sit around the house doing nothing because I'm here to help you. If, it, if she doesn't buy it either. But it could be. She can't deny it. Right? It could be that she's stuck with me because I'm here to help her achieve greatness. It could be. Or a child or a parent, or a lover, or a friend, or an employer, or a boss, or a partner in business. All these things could be, or a teacher, or a rabbi. It could be a very holy soul that's coming here to help because only this person's soul can somehow fix this person's soul. Okay? So I want to focus for a moment, follow carefully, on number two. So number two is achieving a level of perfection that was not achieved previously. Which means, follow very carefully, and I'll give you a story, a very famous story that's passed around the Jewish world. And it's about someone, I believe it happened to the Chazon Ish. The Chazon Ish was one of the great leaders that lived in the past generation in Israel. He was a rabbi. So check this out. He basically would sit and people come visit, ask questions. See, that's how it works with great, great rabbis. And the way it usually works is, he's got people who work for him, right? The students around him. People come in, ask questions on any area of Judaism. So the story is told of... A woman who came in with her child to ask a question. And the question she asked was on, I don't know, something to do with kashrut, kosher laws, you know, chickens, whatever, I don't know. My pot became milchik or something, I don't know. But as she walked in with her son, the child had, um, what's it called, they had the extra chromosome? Down syndrome. Down syndrome, thank you. The child had Down syndrome. And as she walked in with her son, the chazanish stood up for this woman. And then he sat down. And then she asked the question. And they answered the question, and then she left. And the students saw this, and they said, that's really strange. Because usually the rabbi doesn't stand for the people who come to visit him. So they asked him, do you mind, why did you stand? I'll tell you why. Because she had that child with her. And he said, yes. So why would you stand? Because I want to show 
him respect. It's like, but he's a five-year-old Down syndrome kid. And he's like, exactly. He says, listen to this. It could well be that we're dealing here with a very holy soul. Why do I say that? Because this person could fit into category number two we just saw. Meaning this person was very, very great in a previous lifetime and achieved so much greatness and so much goodness. But then God said, you did so much, but you just got a little bit more to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you into this world with limited capabilities. Because just being in this world, we said, gives you an ashama, your soul, a tick and a fix up. So come into this world, just do a little bit, right? And that will be your tikkun. In other words, says the Chazanish, we're dealing with a soul that's very special, that doesn't have too much to achieve. And that's how we actually look at people with disabilities, and we say that if people have such disabilities, or any other disability, or illness, they, it's like a known thing. Whether you talk about reincarnation or not, it's like a holy soul. Because God only gets involved with people who he wants to improve and increase and make great. So this Down syndrome, chi- Down syndrome child was most likely Siddha Hazanish from it. He probably saw things we don't see, but came from a very holy soul previously. And he's just here just to fix it up a little bit, get the job done. Which takes us to another area of thought, which is discussed a lot, and that is why bad things happen to good people. Now that's the famous question that every rabbi gets and loves. I, well, I've got to finish this off because I'm, I'm in my zone. And every rabbi loves that. Oh, rabbi, I have a question for you. Yes, my help. Why are bad things happen to good people? Like, oh, God. Not that one again. It's like 2,000 years they couldn't figure out. Want to figure it out for me? So that's a whole talk in and of itself. But I want to share one answer with you. Now, when I, do, I want to be very careful when I do this. I'm not trying to like, oh, here's the answer. And the answer I'm going to give you now to this very famous theological question is not, I repeat, not an answer we give to people who are suffering in any way, shape, or form. It is purely a theological design thing. You don't say this to people who are suffering in any way. It's rude, offensive, and maybe incorrect in their circumstance. We don't know, but it still exists. However, we see from the Torah sources that this is an idea. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why Down syndrome? Why illness? Why infancy? Because this is a previous soul from a previous life. And they're coming into this world to achieve something. They're coming into this finite physical world to achieve greatness. So God is really just kind of helping them fix up whether something wrong they did in a previous lifetime or something they didn't achieve in a previous lifetime or help them. Maybe this Down syndrome child needs to be born to these parents because his parents, in order for them to have their tikkun, need a Down syndrome kid. And all the challenges that come with it. Which takes us to the next one, which is infant death. God forbid, we shouldn't know such things. Right? Nothing more painful for a child. But if you follow the line of reasoning we're building up over here, it kind of works out that possibly a child dies young as a baby, which we don't say to people going through this, but because this was a very holy soul that just needed an extra month, an extra week, an extra day in this world. I tell you, I, I don't talk about this often, but uh, between some of my daughters, I don't remember which ones anymore, actually, between a few of my daughters, a couple of my daughters, my wife got pregnant and she, she lost the baby, right? She lost the fetus. She had a miscarriage, okay? Which statistically is one in four anyway, so in the religious Jewish world, with a, you know, so it happens, you know. It's still painful, it's still difficult, not, not physically anymore for the most part, thank God, but emotionally a very difficult thing. And uh, so I, I called my rabbi to tell him. He, was actually, he actually lives in England now. And... Uh, he said to me, when I was on the phone with him, I was, you know, a little upset, and he's talking to me, and he says, uh, make no mistake, Lawrence, uh, a fetus gets a ticken. Right? No, that's what he said to me. <laughs> but there's a lot loaded into that word. Right? In other words, even just being a fetus in this world, there's a schus, a merit that a person, it sounds crazy, I know, but a merit that a person has by bringing this child in this world for a few moments. Right? And maybe I need to go through it, but that we are the... The, the, the merit, we, you know, I don't want this merit anymore, but to, to have this challenge and have this child and just come in, you're doing something. It's not for nothing. According to this, it's not for nothing. There's something to it. Just being in this world, even as a fetus, has an impact upon the neshama because fetuses do have a, a level of soul, okay, which is another discussion of now, a level of soul. Not as much as a born a child, right, but some level of neshama 
does exist, okay? So we don't say this to people who have lost children, you know, unless you have that kind of relationship with someone um, as a spiritual advisor, but it's worth noting. There's something, something to it. And one of the famous Kabbalistic books called the Sefer HaBahir uh, says to explain why good things happen to, to one righteous person while bad things happen to another is because the latter did evil in a previous life and is now experiencing consequences. Okay, this can be compared to a person, he speaks pretty forthrightly, who planted a vineyard and hoped to grow sweet grapes. But instead, sour grapes grew. Right, he saw this planting and harvest were not successful, so he ripped it out, he cleaned out the sour grape vines and planted again. When he saw that was not successful, he did it again and again and again. And that's his agricultural metaphor, okay, which is very common in Jewish thought, for the idea of a soul coming back again and again and again. Okay? And uh, the Vilna Gon, the genius of Vilna, Rob Eliyahu, lived a few hundred years ago. By the way, if you get a title in, Jew in Jew Jew Jewish life as the genius, you're probably smart. Okay, he's known as the Vilna Gaon, the genius of Vilna, you know, in, in uh, Lithuania, you know. So we can assume he was a pretty smart person. He says somebody who was a wicked person is in, in first incarnation. God brings him down the time of waning of the moon, whatever that means, and he may live a life of poverty. In other words, in the previous life, he had a lot of money. You didn't use it so well, so I'll bring you back as a poor person. And that will fix up that part of the neshama, the soul, needs to be fixed up. It could be even though he is now righteous. This is a righteous person for whom bad things happen. And this the sages say, length of life, number of children, extent of one's sustenance, do not depend on one's merit, but on one's mazal. Now, we're going to do a whole class on that one where the word mazal does not, does not mean luck. Okay? If it did, it would be very offensive. Oh, you're getting married? Mazal tov, good luck with that. Because this guy, he's crazy. Right? Oh, you're pregnant with twins? Mazal tov, because twins, they just keep screaming the whole night. Right? Luck, as you should realize, having known me a little bit, does not exist in Judaism. Everything happens for a reason. Mazal, different opinions. One opinion is mazal, comes from the word nazul, which means to flow. Things should flow well. Get married at the right time. You should like flow. You want life to flow and not... The Kabbalists say comes from the word mazalot, which means the stars. The stars should be aligned in the right place at the right time so the right person can be born in the right time in this way, in this order. All right? We'll do... That will... So understanding injustice in this world. Now this concept of reincarnation, before we get into details... There's one other way it can help us in life, and in this way, it's a very big way. Imagine you go into business with a person, and you have a partner in business, and the partner, as we hear stories of all the time, wasn't a good guy, people were telling about their bad partners, right, business partners, and you're with this partner, and you were doing so well, and started losing money, and he stole money, and he tried to get it back, and he couldn't get it back, and he fled, and that's the end of the story, and it's all terrible. So let's try for a moment, with the help of one of the sources over here uh, to um, see if we can maybe turn this around into reincarnation. And it's a wild thing, right? Says one of the commentators, uh, there's a verse in the Torah that says, Eileha Mishpatim, these are the laws that you should give. That's from the Torah itself. These are the laws that Moshe should give. Okay, we know that. Okay, well, what other laws would he be giving? So he says, this is a reference that the Zohar says refers to Reincarnation, why? Why would the laws right, of business, for example, have to do with reincarnation? He says, this is a surprising connection. This is unbelievable, by the way. Just check that. This could change your life. It really could, in, in a good way. Seeing that the subsequent verses speak about monetary laws. Okay, so it says, these are the laws, and then the Torah starts to speak about money. And Zohar says, these laws, that's reincarnation. What? What's that got to do with it? So he says, one person accuses another in court that he owes him money. Though the defendant knows he's innocent, the Torah nevertheless maybe obligates him to pay. That happens. You go to court, you get to pay something, you need money, you're innocent, you have to pay, you're guilty, you don't pay. All right? And the other person says, hey, where's my money? This happens all the time in life. What usually happens? People go crazy over this. Say, the Kabbalists, he should not be plagued by this question. Isn't the Torah Torah of truth? whose paths are pleasant, should I, should I be getting my money back? Why isn't God just? That's my money. God knows it's my money, and he won in court of law, or he ran away with the money, and this is unfair, right? How do we understand that? Because this is the Elam Mishpat and the laws of the Torah. How can this be so? He says, undoubtedly, he owed this money to the other man in a previous incarnation, and the Torah is now bringing him back into this world to make him pay it back. 
to his soul another incarnation. I'm, I'm just saying what it says over here. Don't shoot the messenger. Uh, please, don't shoot the messenger. Um, that's what he's doing. He's come back to fix it. As for the person who took the money deceitfully, right, because one of these guys is actually guilty, he will have to give his own accounting in the future, and this is only one example of many possible cases. Imagine living life like that. I mean, I don't, but can imagine living life like that. Every bad occurrence that happens to you, you can say, something I did in a previous life, this is here to improve my soul. And maybe this is a way to live in serenity and tranquility that there's a reason for it. I mean, you try to get your money back, and you're blocked, and you're blocked, and you're blocked, right? And you try to make this thing not happen, and the bad thing happens, nothing you can do about it, because you are obligated to get your money back. We're not Buddhists like, oh, we lost the money, it's all over. You meant to try to get it back, but if you can't, you can't. What you're meant to say after you tried every physical way to get it back is, it could be that actually this is actually a fix-up for something my soul, my soul needs from previous incarnation, and that's why this has happened to me. So how many times can a soul be reincarnated? So some Kabbalists, based upon a verse in Eov, the book of Job, say, based upon this verse, behold, God does all of these things with man two or three times to bring his soul back from the grave to bask in the light of living. By the way, Job, we know, suffered greatly. And he had four friends that advised him to try to help him understand, which is why the book of Job is started by people who go through crises in life. And three of these friends gave him answers, it's a fascinating story, as to why he's suffering. Each time, he kind of pushes them away. It can't be that. Job, by the way, was a very righteous, not Jewish, by the way. It was a non-Jewish individual, according to Rashi, who lived in the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, before the Jewish people went in. He lived there. And he went through tremendous suffering because he was a very holy individual. And these three brothers, these three friends tried to help him, console him, and he kept pushing them away. And the last friend came and said, it must be in a previous life you were. And he didn't give him an answer. As if to say, it could well be. That's the reason why I'm suffering so greatly in this world. So according to that, you see it says two or three times. So some capitalists say a person comes back two, three times and then the game's up. However, the Zohar, and I believe this to be the accepted opinion, the Zohar relates that as long as the soul is improving in perfection between incarnations, it will be given as many chances as it needs, which means you could be here 5, 10, 30, 50. For me, this is my 200th time. I've been here before, and I'm still screwing it up. I can't, you know what? I'm like, God, I give up. You know what I'm saying? Right? I shouldn't even give me a great wife to help me this time. I don't even appreciate it, right? Okay, here's the next question. Is a soul aware of its reincarnated state? So the Sefer Haredim, one of the uh, deeper sources, okay, says, so the Kabbalists say, by the way, we're going to get a little scary now, so are you okay with this? Okay, we're about to get scary, so let's put your seatbelts on, as one of my teachers used to say. The Kabbalists say that even though a soul reincarnated in a human body is unaware of his original incarnation, nevertheless, when it is incarnated in the body of an animal or a bird and other insects or creatures, it is aware of a former incarnation, and it has the anguish and regret over how it was ascended from a human form to the form of a beast. So according to some of the commentators, and the Pella Yoetz, another commentator, disagrees with this, and says that a person can come back in animal form, which takes us to a whole different area of, does that mean my dog is actually my grandfather, or something like that, right? You know what I'm saying? So the answer is probably not, but there are stories. And these are stories that are passed around. If you go to Yeshiva, you hear these stories all the time. Are they true or not? I don't know. But the stories of people, I've heard it myself, and people, that they say they were in synagogue in Israel, and they hear the... Chazan on Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur, a certain dog or a cat comes in or a bird lands next to the window, stays there for a certain time, right, every day to hear Kaddish and then flies away, right? Or a cat comes in at the same time every day, hears Kaddish being read and then leaves the Beit Midrash or the shul. And I said to one of my teachers, Rabbi, this cat, could this be the incarnation of someone that didn't have Kaddish in a previous lifetime and is here to hear it now? And the rabbi says, maybe it is the soul of such a person, or maybe it's just a cat. <laughs> we don't know. According to Kabbalah, righteous people do come back, check this out, as fish. As fish. And actually, one of the blessings that... By the way, we say soul doesn't mean... Again, a body is one physical thing. A soul is like a drop of water. You can drop down and different things can come out of it. So to a soul can be the same thing. You see, a body can't be in two places at the same time, but a soul can be. That's what we're talking about over here. We're, not talking about, we're using physical words to describe a spiritual thing. So, f- 
fish seem to be something, according to Kabbalah, that people reincarnate as, which is why, according to Judaism, it's a mitzvah to eat fish three times on Shabbat. Okay? And the idea being that when you eat the fish on Shabbat, this is such a holy day, the Kabbalists say, you're actually lifting up the sparks of the souls in that fish to higher levels. That's what the Kabbalists say. Anyway, it's a mitzvah to have good, delicious food on Shabbos. It is actually a mitzvah to eat fish because it's a delicious, yummy food. But it could be the Arizal, your great-great-great-grandfather, only used to eat meat on Shabbat because he says the soul of some individual who's put inside that, that meat, right, I can only lift it up on Shabbat because only then I have the right kavanot, the right thought process to lift up the soul. So only eat meat on Shabbat because the holy day. Maybe yes, maybe no. Okay? And the Arizal agrees. He says after a person dies, a person can be reincarnated as an inanimate object or in a plant or in an animal or a human. Most people will not escape their being reincarnated in these ways. The degree of transgression determines yada, yada, yada. Scary stuff. I don't want to talk about it. Um, how about a man to a woman or a woman to a man? Assuming that, you know, reincarnation is real. Could that happen? So I asked this to one of my teachers, and he gave me a very fascinating proof. Um that this actually is possible. There is a, a, a myth people don't realize, when you walk into a cemetery, many people wear their sit-sit out, right? generally speaking. Have you seen people wear their sit-sit out? You've seen people. So I wear them, they're tucked in. But if you wear them out, when you walk into a cemetery, you should tuck them in, right? Because like you're flaunting your mitzvah in front of the dead people. It's like a rush, and like, it's not very nice. So you tuck them in. So there's a famous question asked in the commentators. Let's say a person walks into a cemetery that only has women in it, and women don't have the mitzvah of sit-sit, so leave them out. Right? It's a fair question. Can I leave this? You, somehow there's a cemetery only women in. I don't know why. But, so I'll leave it out because they can't wear sits. I'm not making fun of them. Right? I'm not making fun of them because they can't wear sits in anyway. Right? It's a fair question. And this, uh, I mean, the truth is a deshan, I believe. He actually says, still put them in because the woman who's actually dead there actually could have been a soul of a man in a previous lifetime. Okay? So that's how one of my teachers answered me. So it could well be that I mean, I don't know what a male soul, a female soul is, but uh, you could have a male soul as a female soul, a female soul as a male soul. Uh, it gets uh, messy and pretty interesting as well, if you, uh, if you uh, ask me. Yeah? Um, and says the Mishnah Brura, this is by the uh, very standard text, the Chofetz uh, Chaim, he actually says a person can actually despair of correcting their faults Right? And say, I'm never going to be perfect. I'm going to keep making the same mistakes again. And they shouldn't do this because a person, Hashem, God will give us chances to, uh, to fix it up in the future. One last idea, and then I'll finish with it. Well, we have to finish anyway. But um, there is an idea in Jewish thought that everyone comes into this world to achieve one mitzvah. You've got to do as many as possible, but everyone has their one mitzvah to do. That's such an idea. Some people, they're Sadaka people. Some people, they're prayer people. Some people, they're Torah people. Some people are chesed people, doing kind, kindness, acts of kindness. Right? Some people are charity people. They, some people can like find their, which a person is meant to do, according to the commentators, find they should do as many as they can, but they have one thing that becomes their, mm, right? I'm the money giver, finding charities, I'm the helper, you know what I'm saying? I'm the pre Try to find you know, the one myth that they perfect and do very, very, very well. That's an idea. The Arizal even connects that to reincarnation. And he says, you shall therefore understand, we find the Talmud, certain sages, right, from Jewish history, who would do one thing, and that would become their thing, right? Um, some people are very careful when it comes to the mitzvah of tzitzit, right, or tefillin, right, or shabbat. And he says the secret of that matter is that every sage was particular in the mitzvah, he was lacking in previous incarnation. That means in Jewish history, some people actually knew what they were in a previous life, able to see the mitzvah they were lacking, and actually chose that mitzvah to work on in this world. Now, we're not aware of our previous uh, lifetimes, but they say if you feel there's one thing that you're struggling with, for example, giving charity, it's just hard for you to put your hand in your pocket and give it, or you find it hard to pray, or find it hard to study, or find it hard to be nice to people, that's probably the thing you need to work on because God gives us challenges. And you can maybe concur from that. That was a mitzvah that was missing and lacking from my previous life. I, 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 I put down here at the bottom, uh, there was an, a, a guy, a non-Jewish guy, I mentioned it, Dr. Ian Stevenson. And he's considered to be the, the, the father of this study recently in the past few decades. He was from the University of Virginia. And he studied hundreds of cases of reported reincarnation cases. 
right? And he found hundreds of, he chose 20 of the most scientifically, like controlled, studied ones that held the most water and made them into a book. And you can buy this book and you can read them online. Uh, one of the most famous cases of a young boy uh, in India who, uh, at the age of two and a half, said to his mother, and by the way, funny, in the Eastern world, unlike the Western world, this is actually part of the culture. It's part of the culture. We don't talk about these things. It's not really part of Western world thinking. Well, the soul in general isn't, unfortunately. Uh, it's part of Jewish thinking, but the Eastern world actually has it. So talk of this kind of thing in that kind of world is not unusual, you know. And even they say, even in the Western world, when kids say things, parents at a very age quash it, and it's not spoken about again. But there is one case in India, 1944, of a young boy who basically went to his parents and said, excuse me, uh, I want to visit my wife, <coughs> right, who lives in a town that was 90 miles away. And he described the town and the store that he owned with his brothers in perfect detail. He actually ended up visiting that store, uh, seeing his wife had remarried, right, and he was very embarrassed when he saw her. Uh, telling them um, why the guy had actually taken his money, and he said, I apologize, it's over here, and doing a lot of identification. And he actually went with uh, this individual, Dr. Stevenson, and tracked it and wrote about it. You can see that online if you want to, um, of other secular uh, proofs and ideas within reincarnation. And that is why you may have actually seen me before. In a, okay. <laughs> we'll stop over there. Thank you all very much for coming. And great to see you all again.